Hey, welcome back to the show. We talk about people of color. They're severely impacted by hunger, food access, diet-related illnesses, as well as other problems with the food system. Now, the food justice movement allows communities to exercise their right to grow, sell, and eat healthy food. Green Bronx Machine is an organization building healthy, equitable, and resilient communities through inspired education, as well as local food systems and 21st century workforce development. The school-based model is using urban agriculture aligned to key school performance indicators, growing healthy students in schools to transform communities who are fragmented and marginalized into neighborhoods who are more inclusive and thriving. Joining us now to share more is the founder of the Bronx, I should say Green Bronx Machine, my friend, my brother, Stephen Ritz. And uh, Stephen, good to have you, man. Man, it is good to have you. Hello, Darren, and hello, Bronx. Yes, brother, it is good to have you, man. And I, I, I want to, first of all, wish you a, a happy holiday. Good to have you sharing with us um, and the great work that you guys are doing uh, with the Green Bronx Machine. Uh, and when I, and let's just get right into it and talk a little bit about the Green Bronx Machine because when we talk about social justice, food justice is a major component of social justice. So how do you line up food justice along with social justice from your perspective? Well, let's be clear. And today I'm actually going to do something amazing. I'm going to take off my cheese hat because you know <laughs> okay. what? Food justice is racial justice. And let us not lose fact on the fact that the borough, our beautiful beloved borough of the Bronx, which feeds not only all of New York City, but practically the entire Eastern Seaboard, has Eastern Sea Coast, if you will, has some of the highest rates of food insecurity and diet related diseases in all of New York State, if not the nation. So food justice is racial justice. And in a borough that is increasingly black and brown, we have got to start getting healthy, fresh food to people. And that's what this movement is all about. It is about yeah, well, something greater. And when we talk about it, listen, I mean, honestly, we look and we see how many people are struggling just to have the basic necessities of food insecurity, uh, through food insecurity. Food insecurity is huge. COVID-19 is actually impacting people in a more prevalent way. Talk to us about the work that you're doing right now, even in COVID-19, because things have actually ramped up a whole lot. Well, COVID-19 has the there's no way to say there was a blessing around COVID-19. So let me be clear about that. But what COVID-19 has done, what this virus has done, is called into, into play the, virus, uh, the, the symptomatic virus of three larger viruses, greed, corruption, and racism. It mm. didn't take a virus to kill a quarter of a million people, largely black, black and brown, predominantly poor. Um, and I don't want to discount anybody's life. But let's really talk about where this pandemic is hitting New York City, right here in the Bronx, in parts of Brooklyn, in parts of Queens, in parts of Staten Island, where predominantly the residents are black and brown and immigrant, where predominantly there is limited access to healthy, fresh food. And while we certainly provide the greatest number of essential workers and frontline workers, we will be the last to see the vaccine in communities like ours. So what's the most important thing we can do? Well, the best way to boost your immune system is to consume healthy, fresh fruits and vegetables. And this has been first and foremost on all the work that we have been doing here at Green Bronx Machine since, you know, since schools shuttered back in March and then again recently. And since then, we have found new ways to source food, to secure food, to get people food in ways that we've never imagined. We've leveraged every single asset of our community to put unity in our community. We've leveled foundational elders at NYCHA to be runners and messengers and harbingers of good food. We've planted over 100,000 seedlings um, you know, this summer alone. Between my wife and I, along with some amazing partners, we have personally delivered over 100,000 pounds of food across the borough. Look, I'm up here in school growing food now. We wow. just harvested it out last weekend. Uh, we brought it to, believe it or not, not far from where you're broadcasting from right now, um, not far from the Lehman campus. Part of the solution this weekend, we helped them get food out. The week before, we were at City Harvest and uh, 
Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams, who's a staunch advocate and perhaps for food justice and perhaps New York City's most famous vegan, um, bringing 35,000 pounds of food to, you know, to Melrose houses. So we are out here, we're working, we are working harder, we're working smarter. We figured out ways to get food into communities for children um, week by week. So we drop off food at certain designated locations on Tuesdays and then Zoom cook on Wednesdays and children have the access to these ingredients. It's not about some washed up celebrity chef looking for imprints, you know, talking about, oh, you can cook Chateaubriand while our kids are home, you know, eating Pop-Tart, Pop-Tarts or chips and oftentimes, sadly, nothing. It's really about creating meaningful opportunities so that this horrible moment, and it has been a horrible moment in American history, can give birth to a movement where we remember the pain, the names, and the anguish of each and every person lost in this pandemic. Because now more than ever, it's about education, not asphyxiation. Yeah, I want to talk a little bit more about the work that you're doing in the classroom. Green Bronx Machine, taking it to the classroom, helping students understand their healthy living, helping to really put uh, you know, their foot down in the area of bringing food justice. Talk to us about what you're doing right now and how you know, students are actually playing a huge part in this area. Listen, the students are... I'm here, but they're really running the show because I'm responsive to their needs. You know, the greatest compliment I got this summer was when a child uh, in front of another child asked me to buy him a soda. And the child, the one child turned around and said, asking Mr. Ritz to buy you a soda is like asking your mama for a cigarette. That's mm. the kind of accountability that we want amongst our children. We want our children to understand that they are growing something greater. One of the things that we're really inspired about is we are using solar powered internet providers in our garden. So you don't have to go to Starbucks. You can go to the garden and actually get access to the internet and healthy fresh food and odds are some good kind mentoring with your elders as well. So for us, it's always about how does one and one not make two, but how does one and one make 11? We understand that we're not gonna be invited to the table, so we're gonna build our own. And that's exactly what we're doing. Believe it or not, I mean, Darren, how do I know? And I would have brought pictures of a gentleman named Brother Mike, who's right here in a wheelchair in Claremont Village, delivering food with us weekly via his wheelchair to his mm -hmm. cohort of people. And that's what this movement has really brought about. Incredible heroes. And let us always remember their names and always remember our collective pain. And let this moment not be lost on a movement, I, on a for a movement, because I do not want to get back to normal. I want all of us to get back to better. Right. It's not about normal. It is about better. You use the word movement. I want to talk about that for a minute because, uh, you know, people know you now and they've seen you. And I can say, listen, I've had the luxury of doing you for years when this thing first got started and birthed inside of you to where it is today. Talk to us about that journey, about where you started and where you are today and how people might be able to see a little bit more about that journey, too. Well, you know, listen, that journey started right up the block from Bronxnet, literally on the Walton campus. And I am forever grateful for that accidental moment. But, you know, it, it goes to show you that, you know, you can't rush growth. You can't go from seed to harvest without cultivation in the middle. And that's what this movement mm. is really about. Cultivating people, cultivating opportunities. To think that this very classroom in the middle of Claremont Village in a 110 year old building, still under scaffolding, I might add, has been visited by 60 nations and people from six continents um, to look at our model speaks to something that simply screams from the Bronx to the world that with community all is possible. But it has been a remarkable journey. You know, I highlighted it a few years ago in my book called The Power of a Plant, which went on to become a national bestseller. It's used in school systems all across the world, which makes me proud, including ones where I've been asked to work elsewhere from, I might yeah. add. And you know, now I'm super proud that we in 2021 will be debuting a documentary called Generation Growth. You can visit that on the Green Bronx Machine website. Um, it's a documentary that was two years in the making, highlighting our expansion across the country into some of the most marginalized communities in the world. And this is something now more than ever we need. We need to put the unity 
back into our community. We need to scream that teachers matter and let compassion be the new curriculum. Uh, you know, 2,200 jobs later, here we are. I'm hearing from children this morning who are working on the front line, contributing to food and health and a thriving ecosystem, despite the challenges here in New York City. So it's, it's amazing what can happen. And it yeah. all starts with a seed. You know, children are seeds, ideas are seeds. And the Bronx is one of the most fertile grounds for, you know, absolute disruption possible. And we are proof positive of that. We are not going to let people get fat on the dysfunction of this borough of prior mistakes. Um, we want to empower local residents to be the beneficiaries of years and years and decades of neglect and poor policy to grow something greater. I'm thrilled our children are boycotting fast food. I'm thrilled that they're staying out of that fast food joint up the block that didn't that chain that did not want to pay farm workers who look like their parents one penny more a pound. And every time I keep a burger out of a kid's belly and replace it with a banana, not only am I helping them in their immunity, I'm helping the planet as well, which is awesome sauce. Yeah. Well, I want to get here for a moment because when we talk about that, you're encouraging students to do healthy living. There have been critics who say, first of all, uh, you know, that's a parent's job. But secondly, there are critics who also say, students, they're not going to be really too receptive to that. They're not really going to be able to tap in and buy in. But when it, I think about your work, I think about the things that you've done, I look at the fact of how you were able not just to get student buy-in, you've got parental buy-in, you've got community buy-in. What has been the key and having such a transformative, you know, process uh, in the hearts and minds of those people, because that's not an easy lift, but it seems as though you, 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 you've done it. Well, who could resist the guy with the keys hat? Um, <laughs> you know, it really goes to one simple thing. Children get it. You know, the next generation of Greta Thunbergs and, and the next Malala often sits right here in public housing, the next Barack Obama, the next Darren Jaime, you know, the next Sondra Sotomayor is right here in my classroom. These children get it. They understand that they are the canaries in the coal mine. So just like McDonald's figured it out years ago, how do you scale? You scale through children. It's the mommy, mommy, mommy factor. Listen, my parents didn't stop smoking because the Surgeon General told them it was going to kill them. My parents stopped smoking because my brother and I, ages, I think, you know, nine and four or five at the time, made them crazy. So the mommy, mommy factor works. Listen, McDonald's scales by happy meals, not by happy and healthy people. So by the same token, if you can empower children to have these nurturing relationships with the world, with the planet, and cultivate a palate at a young taste, that, at a young age that puts them on a trajectory of healthy success and healthy living and academic success, my God, we've changed everything. I think, you know, part of the reason why I was able to scale, getting back to your question, is I was dealing with people too late. You know, I remember when you and I had all those older kids, high school kids, and what gave me credibility was jobs. And often, many of them had children themselves. But the key is this, Darren, rich people, poor people. I've never met a person who comes out and says, yeah, I really don't want what's best for my child. I believe every parent wants what's best for their child. And it's up to us to educate them. We need to stop celebritizing food, the official soft drink, the official pizza, the official candy bar. You know, I'm the first to get out there and say, shame on Shaq for pushing all that crap out there. You know, when Beyonce starts giving Diet Pepsi to her kids, I'll start giving it to mine. But in the meantime, don't make money off the backs of people who have built you, off communities who adore you. We need to come together and grow our own local businesses and our own local people and realize that, you know, Eric Adams says it best, you know, for a long time, zip code and skin color determined outcomes in life. But it's, it's no longer birthright, it's breakfast. It's no longer lineage, it's lunch. And it's no longer our DNA, it's dinner that's affecting ourselves. It's mm -hmm. dinner that's really, it, it's what we're eating that is determining health outcomes and financial empowerment often for others around that. Amazing work. I mean, listen, I, I, I sit and I listen all the time and I'm also like amazed just by not that I not that the words that you say, 
but by the fruit that's literally on the tree. How about that one? Uh, and the fruit that you're actually able to bring uh, to a community. And when we talk about the Bronx, we know that the Bronx is still number 62 out of all the counties when it comes to health, but yet and still a lot of improvements. Talk to us about what you see happening for the work that you're doing with Green Bronx Machine uh, and the other things that are happening as we move into 2021 that's going to improve uh, the quality of the neighborhood and then also the quality of what goes on in the borough. Sure. So big shout out to the Bronx overall. The Bronx in my lifetime has never, ever looked better. And I think we only need to remember that I started my teaching in 1984 at South Bronx High School when it was the only standing building for eight square blocks. So the Bronx has come a long, long way. But along that way, we've also kind of developed very quickly. And some of it is overdevelopment. Some of it is we've lost, as I would say, some of our roots. You know, the notion to kind of want these things that we, these shiny objects that we think are so important. We have devalued public education tremendously. And let us be clear, you know, the greatest lever this nation and this city has for creating equity, removing the systemic barriers to injustice is public education. And that's you know, why I am so rooted and committed in this work at the youngest age possible, because education is the great equalizer. Now, we've got to make it equal. Uh, what I'm excited about is there has never been greater awareness about the discrepancies between the rich and the poor. Um, sadly, it took the death of so many African Americans this year. I, hello, the, 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 the bells were going off for years. The alarm clock was going off for years. Did we really need George Floyd to be asphyxiated the way he was for us to say something's not right in our communities? I think not. But again, let us remember his name. Let us remember the pain and let us come together to really grow something better to really reimagine the way we look at children, the way we look at, at problems. Listen, when plant, I'm gonna give you a simple plant analogy. When I grow plants, if the plants don't work, I don't blame, don't grow, I don't blame the seed. We look at the environment. Did I give them enough water? Was the soil healthy? Did they have access to light? We need to start looking at marginalized communities the same way. We can't keep blaming people for being poor. I will tell you that here in the South Bronx, being poor is a tough job. It has never been harder than ever. And the pandemic has really called attention to that around access to the internet, around access to devices, around access to healthy, fresh food. Now, my goal, and thanks to you, your job is to make sure that we cultivate an appetite for equity. It's no longer enough to say, oh, I'm not a racist. And I believe I meet a lot of people each and every day who say they, are, who say they aren't racist and probably believe they're not. But what are we doing in terms of policy that demonstrates that we are actively anti-racist in all that we do? You know, I jokingly say, I'm getting tired of philanthropy and there's been some amazing philanthropy this year. So for those who are donating and contributing and the movements that we see across the borough and across the city and the nation, God bless you. I feel you, I see you, and I appreciate you. But here's the deal. Philanthropy will send a whole bunch of bottles of water to Michigan and we'll judge the efficacy of that philanthropy on how many bottles of water we send. But what we really need is good policy and good policy will make right. sure that those residents have water for life and people who violate that will be dealt with accordingly as in prison because that's what we need to do. We need to stop selling the rights of our children and the future of marginalized communities down the drain for you know quarterly profits. We need to really get to compassion. We need to let empathy be our North Star. And I'm really excited that you know the election is over and uh, one virus is coming to an end as is another. And hopefully we can look to better, brighter days for all of us and the planet. That's what this is about. Stephen Ritz, we gotta leave it there, brother. But thank you so much for the great work that you continue to do, educating our viewers. Um, and we, we must say that, you know, uh, I, I think that you started with the seed uh, and as you started with the seed, it's grown into a plentiful harvest. Thanks a lot, uh, Stephen Ritz, for being with us in the green. Remember this, the most important school supply in the world is food, especially if you don't have it. So fuel your body, fuel your mind. Darren, God bless you. Can't wait to see you. Always a salad waiting for you up here in the classroom, my man. So come visit, you heard?
Bro, I'll be there as soon as I can get there. <laughs> a public education. I'm joking with the kids. I was teaching how to tell time. I feel like the flavor flame of public education these days. <laughs> you have to make epic happen. Much love. Much love, brother. I'll talk to you later. Stephen Ritz, our guest from the Green Bronx Machine. Uh, is it, I, I, and I'll take a moment of personal privilege. I mean, I've known Stephen for a long, long time. And uh, to see where he is today and how many people he's helped uh, and his passion and how it's actually changed down through, not changed down through the years, but it's actually grown, just like the work that he's done. I've shrunk, I've shrunk, but it's grown. Yes, yes sir. We, we love him. Stephen Ritz.